and after the meeting, uh, there was an auction. Is that right? It was. It went went to auction the first time in 2011. Um, there wasn't enough interest for the auction to proceed, so it was cancelled and withdrawn from the market. But after your meeting with Mr Bassett, sorry, in, in oh, March, Oh, okay, no, that, that, that was earlier. Yes. No, there was an auction after the meeting in 2015. Um, I think it was very early April. It went to auction. Um, Sean was aware that it was going to auction. He actually sent us an email wishing us luck. Um, at the auction, it was passed in. We had bidders on it. Um, but the bidders who were the the highest bidder at that point had flown back to Brisbane. So the agents told us that they would pursue that bidder over the coming days to see if they could close the sale. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that Mr Bassett wished you luck for the auction. There's an email that you exhibit to your statement at uh, RD13, Mr Dillon, that you've got your statement there, oh, but I'll read out the document ID, which is NAB. 134.009.3004. We go to the page that's dot .3006 and maybe put the last two pages up on the screen. Well, we see there Mr Bassett on the... His name has been redacted, but you can see the bottom... That, sorry, the address has been redacted, but you can see his name at the bottom. Hello, Ross. I believe you have the property going to auction today. Just wanted to wish you well today. I hope it's a great result for you. Now, if we could have the two pages 3005 and 3006 put on the screen. Thank you. Uh, you have written to Mr Bassett on the 23rd of April. Hi, Sean, not sold, very strange day, passed in without reaching the reserve, one interested party after two visits and pest inspection, etc. we were hopeful. Um, you relay some of the information that I you recapped on just then. And then on the next page, so we will press on trying to sell, but it is the last time I go to auction in my lifetime. And then you say, Dale and his wife are going to the Manula Bar unit next week to supervise some renovations, two packing cupboards and new bench tops, etc. And it should be on the market very soon. Hopefully some same people will be interested. Thanks for your good wishes. Now, that Malula Bar unit, is that the one that you mentioned before? It is. The trust. But that's the one that you said before, didn't, you haven't sold that? No. That never sold. I see. And then if we go to the very first page of the document, 3004. Mr Bassett has written back to you saying very strange. No accounting for how people's minds work. And then down the bottom he says, could I ask that you give me an update once waters have settled on the auction and as you move on Moolabar and you then write back shortly or later in the day, hi Sean, I will keep you abreast of developments. We are not giving up on selling both. Okay. Now, the other thing that Mr Bassett mentions in the email in the middle of his email is we are working towards a formal answer from the bank on the present funding request, which will provide some assistance up until September 30. What is that in reference to, that funding request, Mr Dillon? I wasn't actually running the business at the time, but my understanding from talking to Lou and Mike was that we were going to hit a, a bump because ABH, Allen's Billy Hydes, were in default with us. We knew exactly how far the overdraft would have to go, so Lou had made a request to the bank to get a temporary increase to the overdraft and the trade facility of 100,000 on each. Um, and that's, yeah, that's what that was about. And did Goanna Down sell after this, this email exchange? Did you sell Goanna Downs? Yeah. And what did it sell for, Mr um, 2.22 million. Was that the price you wanted? No. What did you want? Two and a half. And did you sign a contract to sale? I did. And did you tell Mr Bassett that the property had been sold? We did. did how did you tell him? In an email or a phone conversation or...? I don't recall, but he was told, obviously. 
And after the sale, your solicitor sent an email to Mr Bassett, sending through a copy of the front page of the contract. You have exhibited that email to your statement. And that is NAB 1340092526. Uh, so this email from your solicitor says, uh, I now attach a copy of the front page of the contract. Please note that I have forwarded the relevant discharge authority to the NAB in order to have the discharge process commenced in anticipation of settlement occurring within the next six weeks. Uh, what did you understand that to be a reference to, Mr Dillon? I didn't really know. I don't know how property transactions go. I just assumed it was the normal process. Now, you also exhibit to your statement Mr Bassett's response to that email. And that is at nab.134.006.4961. Perhaps if we put that one on the screen with 4962, that would be helpful. We got that document. So, thank you. Uh, so we see there the, bo the very bottom email that we can only see the bottom of, but that was the email that uh, from the solicitor sending through the first page of the contract. And then Mr. Bassett has said received. Thanks, Kate. Are you able to also forward the discharge authority through to yourself? To myself, sorry. Um, now we can see your response up there. But what did you think when you read that email from Mr. Bassett to the solicitor? I was concerned. Um, I was concerned, A, that the bank was contacting my solicitor without asking me to do so. But I was also concerned because I sort of... Kate had indicated she'd sent through the relevant documentation, which I presumed had gone to some department in the bank that handles mortgages and discharges and all those sorts of things. I wanted to know why did he want a copy of it in his hands? What was the relevance? And you have written to Mr Bassett after that, saying, Hi, Sean, I would like to know why these things are being requested by yourself. Is this normal? I'm sorry, but I am very suspicious of NAB and its motives ever since I felt we were badly treated a few years ago. What is that a reference to, Mr Dillon? The first visit to SBS in 2010. The bank is the one who has been pressing us to sell Goanna Downs, and now we have accepted a price below what I would have liked in order to fulfil the bank's request. I am starting to feel there may be a motive I have not been made aware of. I would appreciate a clarification of your role in the sale of our property. <coughs> our intentions have always been to do the right thing by clearing the mortgage, clearing the redraw facility, inject the requested 200,000 international music, and we will clear the lease on the Ranger and probably sell the Mazda Ranger and clear the lease on that as well. All this reduces the bank's exposure by over 1.4 million. I would have thought a good outcome for NAB. Please let me know truth of the requests. Did you receive a response to this, Mr not, Dillon? Not by email, no. Now, the next day you had a telephone discussion with Mr Bassett. I can did. You, can you, what can you recall from that telephone discussion? I recall it pretty well. <laughs> I was walking down the streets of Wagga with my wife. Um, we were actually killing time. I had a horse running in the Wagga Guineas that afternoon. And <clears throat> we were just waiting for the track to open and all that sort of thing. So I would guess it was around 11-ish, something like that. Sean rang me and said, Ross, I'm sorry, but I've got to tell you, we're taking all the money from Goanna and we're putting you back into SBS. I remember my reaction couldn't be printed publicly because it was pretty blue. Um, 
I was instantly furious because I, I, as per that email, I had suspected he was up to something. I didn't know what, or the bank was up to something. I don't know who was up to something. But yes, I, I sort of said, I think I said to him uh, something to the effect of, well, what are we supposed to do when we move to Melbourne? How do we buy a house if we've got no cash left? And he listened quietly. He didn't make a big song and dance. Um, I did. And pretty much I hung up and that was that. My wife was with me. She had no idea because she wasn't hearing his end of the conversation. And with the language I was using, she couldn't understand what was going on. She knew something wasn't right, but yeah, it was a pretty rugged conversation. And a few days later, you attended a meeting with Mr Bassett and there was someone else from the NAB there. Do you remember who that was? Margaret Moynihan. And what was her role? She was our new uh, manager in the SBS department to manage our file. Was there anyone else at that meeting? Uh, Mike McMahon and Louisa Buchanan. What do you remember from that meeting, Mr Dillon? Very little. <laughs> I think all three of us were in an absolute state of shock. Do you mean the um, three of you being Louisa, Louisa Mike, Mike and I? Um, up to that point, it had only been that we were going to lose the home. But it was made clear at that meeting that they were going to also reduce our facilities, not only to the level that the payout would allow, but even lower. And that was just disastrous for all three of us. We were trying to process how we're going to get through this. One of the things I remember thinking at the time is that we have to comply because if we fight this in any way, they're going to pull the pin on us all together. Now, having sold Goanna Downs, no bank would look at our business with no bricks and mortar behind it. And Margaret was saying, well, one of the reasons we're having to do that is because we have no security. And I said, well, no, you don't. You just sold it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was a difficult day. But I don't remember a lot of detail about who said what. And the next day you received an email from Ms Moynihan. That's exhibited to your statement. It's NAB 1340092614. sent to you and to the email addresses are redacted but Mike and Louisa copying Mr Barrett Bassett. Dear Ross, Mike and Louisa, thank you for making time to meet with Sean and I to discuss matters relating to national music and Goanna Downs. This email deals with two topics of discussion, the application for funding for national music <coughs> and the distribution of settlement funds relating to the sale of Goanna Downs. Now, the application for funding, is that what you were mentioning before about the request for the uplift? I believe so. The 100 for um, overdraft and 100 for trade was the request. Yes. And Ms Moynihan there says, your application for funding of 200,000 was processed by Sean and referred to NAB credit for review. The review was completed and the file referred to SBS for further investigation. The file was categorised as an SBS file on Thursday, 30 April 2015, and is now being managed by myself with Sean's assistance. And she sets out there below the reason for the referral is the level of risk for further funding is assessed as being high. And there are three bullet points there. Do you recall what you thought about those bullet points? I do. Um, the first bullet point she mentions is the fact that the previous year we had incurred a $13,000 loss. It doesn't mention the fact that we were about to make a $100,000 profit. And I thought it was a little ironic after 25 years with NAB having literally contributed millions in fees, charges and interest that they would want to do this for a $13,000 loss. I was more than a little staggered. The balance sheet um, they describe as weak and we totally agreed with that. Always have done. We knew things had to change. There was no argument on that front whatsoever. Um, a lack of working capital return to the business from trading. You have advised a forecast net profit in 2015 of 120. Well, we didn't make it. We got 100 instead of 120, but 
given where we'd been, that we felt that wasn't too bad at all. And further down below on that page, there's a heading Goanna Downs. An unconditional sale contract has been secured on Goanna Downs for 2.22 million to settle mid-June 2015. Ross has indicated that he is willing to provide the following to NAB from the net settlement funds of 2.12, and there are some figures there. Um, we might put the next page up on the screen as well, thank you, 2615. If we could have those two side by side. Uh, now, what did you think when you read what was below there, below well, the heading? It says Ross has agreed. It's not like I was asked the question, do you want to? There was no agreement. It was, we were told, this is what's happening. I never agreed to anything. We agreed that they could do what they wanted because they had us under the thumb, so to speak. But, um, yeah, I found that a, an interesting comment that I was willing to do this. I was never asked. We were told. And then further down on the page 2615, under the heading Goanna Downs, the proceeds of the Goanna Downs property sale are to be applied to the NAB facilities as detailed above. This will leave a shortfall of 257,766 to be rolled into existing facilities. Uh, the figures that are set out here, do you understand these figures or did you understand these figures, Mr Dillon? No. Do you understand them now? No. Okay. Um, thank you. So what, what did you do after that, when you had that initial meeting and had got this email? Well, Louisa, who is very good on numbers, uh, she didn't understand them. Mike didn't understand them. From our point of view, the maths didn't add up. So we thought the best sort of path from here was to speak to Nigel Fisher, who was a senior partner in Pitch Partners in Brisbane, who was our accountants at the time. And we needed to get him involved to try and work out exactly where she was heading with all this. And did you attend a further meeting with Ms Moynihan and Mr Bassett? You mentioned at the start of your evidence that there was another meeting on the 11th of May. Is that the meeting? That was the first meeting between Mike, Lou and I, Nigel Fisher and Margaret and Sean. Actually, I'm not sure if Sean was at that, but I know Margaret was. Do you remember what was discussed at that meeting? I didn't participate much in the discussion. I sat and listened. Um, Louisa and Nigel um, led the discussions with Margaret about how to apportion the residual after the, um, the mortgage and the redraw facility had been paid. I think the residual was in the order of 950000 or something. How to apportion that against what facilities and what would be the various impacts. That, at that stage, the trade facility, my recollection is it was about 1.5 million, and the discussion included a sum of around about 650,000. That rang alarm bells with Lou because we couldn't see how we could trade at that, but that, at that point, nothing was settled. It was just a, a discussion about how they were gonna put it to the accounts. Uh so you mentioned alarm bells. Did you discuss with Louisa and Nigel how the business would function with that sort of level of facility, the trade facility? Not during the meeting. We, we discussed it at length over time. Um, but yeah, the, the general consensus was we couldn't function with 650 and hope to do $5 million worth of turnover. And did you raise that issue with the NAB at the meetings in May? Or one of the meetings in May? Um, I don't remember raising it myself. I know it was raised on multiple occasions. Uh, I know Louisa certainly expressed concerns. I can't truthfully say whether I recall raising it personally, but it, ha it was raised with them by National Music. After that, Mr Fisher put forward a proposal for the facility levels, working within the limits that uh, had been originally proposed by the NAB. Is, is that correct? Is that what happened? He did. Now, would you have done anything differently, Mr Dillon, if you had been told before you sold Goanna Downs that you would not receive any of the sale proceeds or that the National Music Trade Facility would be almost halved? I wouldn't have sold because I understand how hard it is to move somebody on who's up to date with their payments. 
We had an offer on the table from another gentleman who owns one of the most successful stallions in Australia. That was two and a half, but he couldn't fulfil that offer for probably up to a year because he had to wait until his stallion check came from the stud. And at that time, um, we accepted because we felt under pressure from the NAB, but we wouldn't have even accepted if, if we'd known we weren't going to get a penny. No way. We would have waited. And what happened with the profits of National Music after the trade facility came down to that much lower level? It was a disaster. <laughs> we, well, as I said, we had made a profit in the 2015 year of 100,000, so we'd made, I think, nine profits out of 13 up to that point. The loss was 13,000. The first year after the facility was reduced, we lost, and I've forgotten the exact number, it's 70 or 80,000 in that vicinity. And the second year, we lost, I think, $270,000. And why do you think the profits dropped like they did? Well, I know why they did. Um, because we were consistently out of stock because under a regime of 650,000, Louisa was forced into a situation where she would order what she could, but we had to pay cash for anything else. Well, that means you've got to wait until you collect it. So consequently, our ordering patterns dropped dramatically. Uh, and when you're out of stock, you can't supply. That creates a problem with your retailers because if you're selling them product A, and they've been buying off you for several years and all of a sudden they can't get it, they'll switch to product B. So when it comes back into stock in three months' time, you think it'll try and win them back from product B. And that is a real issue. The second thing that was a consequence of that is our suppliers overseas have expectations that you will purchase a certain amount each year. They're always very demanding, wanting growth every year. When your purchasing goes down, you run the risk of losing products to distribute, and we did lose a few products. Do you think the business could have moved into different product lines? We tried hard to focus more on high turnover lines. Um, things like strings for guitars and violins and things, because they're an air freight, you can bring them in 12 times a year. So you can get an order every month. So they sell quickly, you can rotate it, it's much easier. But you can't do that with the main product lines like guitars and violins and to just try and say, well, all right, let's replace and get another million dollar product is nearly impossible. The main brands throughout Australia are very heavily guarded by every distributor like us. Um, and picking up a new product that is successful in the marketplace is a difficult thing to do. So it usually takes several years to achieve. And how did you survive through this period of depressed profits, Mr Dillon? How did well, the business survive? We wouldn't have survived, other than the fact I have a brother who is reasonably comfortably off and was prepared to put in about a half a million dollars into the business to try and carry us through those losses because we had made a lot of changes and we could see there's light at the end of the tunnel, but getting there, we couldn't make it unless we had a a cash injection to cover those losses, and John did that for us. That's your brother? My brother. Yeah. And what changes did you make throughout this period? You mentioned changes that... We made a lot of changes. The, in February 2016, we'd been going for six or seven months since they changed the facilities on us, <coughs> and by then it had become clear that it was unsustainable, so we couldn't get an increased facility, so basically we had to remodel the business to drop our costs dramatically to try and accommodate this. <coughs> um, Michael McMahon, who'd been the managing director since we bought the business, um, he volunteered to leave the business because it was clear that it couldn't support both of us as well as the staff. And he was pretty stressed by then, so he was happy to go and try and do something else. That dropped a considerable sum of money out of the costs. We then um, had to find a, a new premises um, where we could get a, a cheaper rent deal. We saved about 50000 a year on a different premises because the lease was up, fortunately, at the right time. Um, and we implemented all the normal sort of cost-saving exercises. Eventually, we ended up 
dropping having a rep in Victoria, which saved another bunch of money. I went back on the road to cover Victoria. Um, so it was yeah, trying to do it as economically as we could. And has National Music asked NAB to increase the trade facility limits since 2015? Uh, we have. How often have you asked or how many times do you think? Oh, probably three or four with Tara. Tara's our new SBS manager. Um, yeah, it's, it was a few times. And earlier this year you asked again, uh, you asked, was it Tara? Yeah, in, in July last year, I asked Tara if we could get a, um, a $300,000 increase in the trade facility. And the answer was no. But if you can achieve a significant turnaround in the business, because you have to remember at that time we were losing a lot of money every month. Um, if you can achieve a significant turnaround over the next six or seven months and show us that you've got the business sort of back on track under the new uh, facilities, then we'll look at it again in January, February. And did you speak with her again in January or February this year? Yeah, we had a meeting in February and I put the figures on the table, uh, which she knew anyway because we report to her regularly, but we had turned it around. We'd turned, for the equivalent period in the previous year, we had about $130,000 loss at that stage. At the same period this year, we're in a $70,000 profit. So we'd achieved a $200,000 turnaround uh, profit-wise. I was actually pretty happy because I thought that was a pretty good result given the stress we were under. Um, yeah, so that, that was the situation. And what happened during the meeting? What did you discuss? Well, I, I said to her, you know, like, OK, here are the numbers. When do we get our increase? Um, basically, she didn't have to refer to anybody. She just said, look, I'm sorry, but we can't do it. We need to see another 12 months of continued improvement, and then we'll consider it again. At that point, I expressed my displeasure, because having been told it would be considered, it clearly wasn't being considered. I then said to Tara, who is a lovely lady and has been trying hard to help us, but I said to Tara, look, there's a Royal Commission coming up. I've had enough of this. I'm going to tell my story. And have you made a public <coughs> submission to the Commission? I have. So why did you make that public submission? Because I felt it might be cathartic to get it off my chest. <laughs> and what impacted the events that you've given evidence about here and in your statement, have in your family? Pretty devastating. I um, didn't sleep for two years. Um, just running numbers through my head because it was always a fear that they're going to shut us down, they're going to shut us down. We've now not got a home. What are we going to do? You try and run through the numbers of how you're going to exist. My wife has had an even worse effect. Um, she has had some signs of memory issues back in 2014-15 and was tested by a specialist. We feared uh, maybe early onset dementia. Um, she was retested again three months ago. The specialist said she's got severe depression, which is accelerating the onset of dementia. She was tested and since the two tests from 2015 to 2018, there'd been a 25% drop in cognitive function, um, she struggled really hard. Uh, no further questions. Oh, I will just ask one further question. Uh, and you've now got the increase in the facility, is that correct, Mr Dillon? Um, after Tara said no, and I sort of went off the tree a little bit about coming to the Commission and whatnot, she did ask, is there anything I can help to, with the Commission? She went away. I wasn't aware, but Lou told me later that she had actually been working behind the scenes to see what she could achieve, and she was able to achieve 50% of what we had asked for as an increase. So there was some result. And has that had a change or an impact on the business? Can you tell if that's made a difference? Absolutely. We now have stock on order. Um, obviously, we've done all our Christmas orders already, and we now have enough stock in the pipeline that we can actually achieve a $5 million plus year in the following financial year. 
We'll probably still register a small loss this year, nothing like last year, fortunately. Um, but we're anticipating returning to the black next year. Thank you, Mr. Dillon. Thank you, Ms. Right. Dears. Yes, Ms. Harris. <coughs> Mr. Dillon, my name is Wendy Harris, and I uh, need to ask you some questions on behalf of National Australia Bank. That's fine. Mr. Dillon, uh, in uh, paragraph six of the witness statement that you prepared ahead of today and also again in your evidence today, mm -hmm. you say uh, you said that you put Goanna Downs on the market in 2011. That's correct. Um, and that was part of a plan to move to Melbourne to be near your son and his wife and uh, anticipated grandchildren. Correct. Um, you haven't mentioned it in your evidence, but do you recall that you had, in fact, put the property on the market a year earlier, in 2010, as a part of a strategy to reduce debt? No, I don't recall it. Uh, in paragraph five of your statement, Mr Dillon, uh, and you touched on it again in your evidence today, you mentioned that National Music recorded a loss in 2010. That's correct. And that in 2010, your relationship banker was Kevin Matthews. Correct. And uh, you say in your statement that Mr Matthews knew your business inside out. He did. Uh, you found him to be easy to deal with. We did. You found him to be careful. We did. You found him to be thorough? We did. And indeed, Mr Matthews became a friend? He, he has. Um, Mr Matthews, uh, is it correct to say that in around early 2010, the business was experiencing significant cash flow and other financial problems? That's, it was, it was, that was at the start of the GFC downturn. And uh, were you aware that at that time, Mr Matthews referred National Music's file to SBS? In 2010? In early 2010. I, I never knew who referred it. I knew he was our, our business manager at the time, so I knew he would be fully aware of what was happening. Yes. Just, just to be clear, Mr Matthews, not, uh, Mr Dillon, and I'll take you to the documents, but you have given evidence about a referral in the second half of 2010. I'm talking about a separate referral early in 2010. Were you aware of that? No. Can I show you uh, document NAB 005 Uh, Mr uh, Dillon, um, you're aware, I think, that uh, a, a witness statement has also been filed from a NAB employee, Ross McNaughton. Are you I'm aware, aware of, of it? That? Have you seen that statement? I have. I didn't actually see it until last night, and as it's about 60 pages long, I haven't read it. <laughs> I've I seen understand. bits of it, but, but not I, in detail. I understand. And, and so I take it, Mr Dillon, you haven't seen the exhibits to Mr McNaughton's statement? No. So the document that I'm showing you is an exhibit to his statement uh, at tab 58, and you'll see uh, it's headed categorisation or removal of categorised indicator referral form. Do you see that at the top? I do. And then in the box immediately below that, it says, to SBS executive from Kevin Matthews. I see that. And if you go, uh, if we go to the next page, 0004. Uh, you'll see there's a heading background, a few lines down the page. Yep, got that. And then under that business operations brief details, Refer Portfolio Review Group Mark Teakin Report Attached. Yes. Uh, sorry, before we leave that document, can we go back to the preceding page, 0001, so that I can draw attention to the date? <coughs> 
triple O one. I think it was January two thousand. It was. It was, Mr. Dillon. I fourteen. Know it fourteen the time. January. Um, could we then, with that um, having been established, can we then move to NAB 005-418-0039? Again, this is uh, an exhibit to Mr McNaughton's statement. Double O five four one eight. Here we are. So this is. Uh, do you see the heading portfolio review group? Yes. And then uh, below that, national music volunteered. Uh, below that, a reference to Mr. Kevin Matthews, and then PRG reviewer Mark Teakin, which is the name we saw in the previous document. Yes. And so. Uh, you can take it that Mr McNaughton's evidence will be that this is the uh, report referred to in that categorisation form. Can we uh, bring up, please, uh, pages, uh, page 0041? What page number are you after, Ms. Harris? 0041. 0041. Look at the slow documents. And do you see there's a heading about a third of the way through the page, summary and recommendations? Yes. And uh, the second dot point, uh, sorry, the third uh, dot point, no, let's, say, let's look at the second dot point. You see it says, overall PRG's brief review suggests the business has significant cash flow issues generated from both P&L and balance sheet perspectives, and if not corrected, will result in business failure. I do. Uh, and then below that, clearly a first option here is for the owner to inject further capital into the business, but failing this option, business performance issues need to be addressed urgently. I do. And then uh, the, uh, can you read the fifth and sixth dot points, the ones that uh, refer to PRG suggests and then specialist business advisor? Specialist. Yes. And so you see there that the report uh, recommends that a, a, a business performance review be undertaken. Yes. And do you remember Mr Matthews communicating to you that uh, suggestion? Yes, they sent a, a specialist out. And, and so you agreed to undertake the review? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, now, do you remember receiving the report of the reviewer? No, I remember his comments on the day, because he was with us for a day. Can I... Uh, but I don't remember seeing any report. Um, do you remember that the person who undertook the review was Mr Fisher, who subsequently became your accountant? No. Can I bring up, please, uh, NAB 005-379-0027. This is another exhibit to Mr McNaughton's statement. Do you see that's the uh, review that was conducted of National Music dated 3 March 2010, the independent review. Do you recall seeing that document before? Nope. 
Doesn't mean I didn't get it, but I certainly don't recall it. I, I, indeed. And, and Mr Dillon, if, if at any time you want some time to read through what I'm showing to you, then you, you just need to let me know. Yeah, that's fine. Um, can we go to uh, the second and third pages of that document, which is 0028 and 0029? Can we put them side by side, please? Sorry. And so uh, the, the part of the report that I want to direct your attention to, Mr Dillon, appears on the second of those pages, in the, uh, starting at the fifth paragraph. Perhaps have a look at the third paragraph, which refers to the management team of Buchanan, McMahon and Dillon. Which page are you on? Oh, oh on the on second the of those page. pages, Sorry. 0029. Right. And so the, um, Mr Fisher is uh, reflecting on um, his observations of that management team. And then uh, in paragraph five, he says, we are advised it is also likely that the owner will contribute capital into the business prior to 31 December 2010 from the sale of personal assets. That's it. You see that? And then, and then at the bottom of the page, the very bottom of the page, uh, that's picked up again where he says, owner needs to recapitalise the business quantum to be determined, however, it may be in the order of $600,000 to $800,000. This outcome will reduce the required break-even uh, turnover margin. Do you see that? I do. And then uh, Mr Fisher um, from page 11 of the report uh, makes uh, a series of operational findings and recommendations. You can see that from 0037. I'm sorry, that's 0035. You might even take my word for it, Mr Dillon, because the thing I really want to draw your attention to is on um, 0044. It says since the, uh, the system is being very slow. So that's the first page. You see operational findings and recommendations. I do. And then if we can skip to 0044. See, there's a heading financing. Yes. Existing bank covenants not being met. The business is heavily funded by bank, te be uh, bank debt issues 19 and 20. You see those? Yes. And uh, in the, uh, the right-hand column, the third paragraph says, it's strongly recommended that funds are injected into the business by Ross Dillon to reduce the expense associated with bank debt 
It's proposed that Ross inject funds upon the sale of non-business assets as the timing and quantum of this injection is unknown. It's not been included as part of our forecasting model. See that? Yep. Um, now, you didn't dispute any of the findings that had been made by uh, the independent reviewer in this report, did you? I don't actually remember the report. Can I, can I um, try and refresh your memory with a letter that you sent to Mr Matthews after having received the report? It's again exhibited to Mr McNaughton's statement at tab 64 and the document number is NAB 134 021 0035. Now, I probably need to show you, uh, we'll get to the last page. Can you take my word for it at the moment, Mr Dillon, that the last page is signed, kind regards, Ross Dillon, National Music. We'll come to it in a minute. I don't doubt that. And uh, so you see, uh, in the, from the first two paragraphs, you're writing in response to the Johnson Rock report. Yep. And, and you say, as you'll be aware, Michael, Louise and I were heavily involved with the accountants supplying the information that they required in order to formulate their report. And you go on to say that you're instigating change in response to the, the issues, which, some of which you'd already anticipated. Yes. You see that. Can we skip then to pages 0038 and 0039? We side, side by side, please. And uh, do you see under the heading 19 and 20 financing, which is in the bottom third, uh, about two thirds of the way down through the page, you respond to those two items that I took you to in the Johnston report. Firstly, with respect to bank covenants. Yes. Do you see that? And then in the second paragraph, you say the injection of further capital by the owners is only possible upon the sale of Goanna Downs. This is an expensive property and we would like to ensure it returns the maximum possible in order to reduce bank debt. This Correct. will clearly take some time to achieve. Do you, do you, recall, yes. uh, do you recall writing this letter? Nope. Um, uh, and do you see on the last page, uh, you include in effect a, a, a personal message to Mr Matthews and can I draw your attention to the second last paragraph where you say, my return to active duty in the business will ensure we, did, we do not fall into the same mistakes we have made in the last couple of years. Our reliance on debt driven growth will not reoccur. You see that? I do. And, and that was your intention, was it not, in 2010? Oh, yeah, I increased my visits to Brisbane, basically. Uh, but it was also... Uh, your intention that your reliance on debt-driven debt growth would not reoccur. Uh, I, I have to confess to not fully understanding how the bank quantifies debt-driven growth. But Mr Dillon, this is your letter. I think that might be quoting them. Um, well, Mr Dillon, I don't think those words appeared in the Johnston Rock report, but do you agree with me that even if they did, you've adopted them in your letter to I, Mr Matthews? I, clearly, I wrote it. Indeed. And does that assist you to recall that the first time you put Goanna Downs on the market was not in fact 2011, but was 2010? No, it doesn't. I see. Um, do you, so I take it then that you don't recall uh, committing at that time to Mr Matthews to apply virtually all of the sale proceeds from the sale of Goanna Downs to the reduction of debt? No, I don't. Can I show you uh, a document NAB 005 342 0022? Oh, sorry, that was, should be 0032. Um, I beg your pardon. 
Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, it was 005 342 0022. It might be 0021, in fact. Uh, now, uh, again, this is exhibited to Mr McNaughton's statement and he deposes that this is what's known as uh, an EBL submission, um, which is a business credit lending submission put together by a relationship banker in support of a change to a customer's facilities. And you see that it's been created by your banker, Mr Matthews. I do. In respect of national music. I do. And at the date of it's the 14th of April 2010. Right. Could we uh, put... Now, I don't know whether this is a challenge uh, with landscape documents, but the, do the pages that I want to show you are 0023 and 0024. So this is 00323 and uh, you see under the purpose there's a reference to the market rate facility and in the second paragraph it says this submission now seeks to further extend this facility until 2000, October 2010 and allow a redraw of funds repaid and then uh, he sets out the amounts and the dates which you were seeking by way of that redraw. Does that ring any bells with you, Mr Dillon? No. Uh, let me then um, direct your attention to the second of the pages that now appears on the screen, 0024. And uh, the second paragraph says, our security property known as Goanna Downs is on the market for sale by expressions of interest of 2.8 million to 3.2 million. There are currently two very interested parties, etc. Whilst promising and principals are committed to quitting the property, this may take some time. Then he says, principals will retain $800,000 to a million to purchase another PPR, a, pl a principal place of residence, with the balance of settlement funds to be applied to debt reduction. This will see the PPCK, which is your personal borrowing, cleared in full 1.15 million and a significant reduction in the trade facility, the balance of business debts will be secured by the new property to be purchased. We are hopeful that this may occur by the next review date, December 2010. Now, Mr Matthews is recording their information that he must have obtained from you. Would you accept that, Mr Dillon? I, I don't recall any of this. I haven't seen any of this in recent years. It's eight years old, obviously. We've had three reviews in that time. But it doesn't it say principals will retain about 800 to a million dollars in order to purchase another principal place of residence? Which it was it all, does. Yes, it mm, does, that's what I thought Mr it Dillon. And, and so uh, can I revert to the question that I asked you? I accept that you don't remember it. Uh, the, the question that I asked um, was, do you accept that Mr Matthews is recording their information that he must have obtained from you? Not necessarily. Uh, I didn't have the day-to-day -day operational functions of things like the market rate facilities that it could well have come from Louisa. Um, Mr Dillon, I'm referring to the, the matters which appear in those three paragraphs at 0024. He must have obtained the information 
that Goanna Downs was on the market for sale by expressions of interest in the range of 2.8 to 3.2 million from you. Do you accept that? I accept it's possible. My first recollection, because as I said, it's eight years ago, my first recollection of selling or trying to sell the property was the auction in 2011. I accept that, Mr Dillon. And, and can I make clear that I have absolutely no criticism of your memory? I can barely remember what I had for lunch yesterday. So I'm not criticising your memory, Mr Dillon. I'm asking you to accept that the only place that Mr Matthews could realistically have obtained that information is from you. About the sale of the property? Indeed. No, not really. He could have got it from Mike or Lou, because if it was on the market, they would have known. It probably did come from me, because Kevin and I talked regularly. And, and but I just don't remember it being on the property that are on sale that early. Uh, Mr Dillon, you said early in your evidence that Mr Matthews was a careful man. As far as I know. And that he was a thorough man. As far as I know. And he knew your business inside out. He did. Mr Matthews has recorded here that the principals are committed to quitting the property. Do you think it's likely that he made that up or do you think it is no, more no, no. likely? We, we had always spoken to Kevin about we will sell the property. Always. And you made the point to me about uh, the principals you and your wife retaining 800,000 to a million in order to purchase another residential property. Yes. Is it likely that that information came to Mr Matthews from you? Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, looking at the balance of the, the paragraph, referring to a significant reduction in the trade refinance facility, is it likely that that was something that you and Mr Matthews has, had discussed and he then recorded here? I think I said earlier I had discussed it with Kevin from the very beginning. And that the balance uh, of the business debts will be secured by the new property to be purchased. Do you accept that's something you're likely to discuss Absolutely. with Mr Matthews? Thank you. Um, now, uh, can I take you to a further uh, EBL submission of Mr Matthews? Again, exhibited to Mr McNaughton's statement, it is NAB Uh, so this is, uh, you see this is EBL submission 25 for National Music, again created by Mr Matthews, and the date of creation is the 1st of September 2010. Yes. And uh, can I take you to page uh, 0034? Can we have actually 0034 and 0035 up together? So that's 0034, and you see the first paragraph, there's an application to waive repayments due on facility P18, which you can take it from me, Mr Dillon, is your market rate facility, which had been scheduled at 200,000, 150,000, 100,000 on the three consecutive dates mentioned there. See that? I do. Um, now, if you look about halfway down the page, uh, can you read to yourself uh, from the line that says, overall the business is well controlled? Yes. Down to the bottom of the page and then the first two paragraphs on the next page.
just to the bottom of the page. And then the first two paragraphs on the on uh, 0035, if you don't mind. That. So, so going back to the start of that passage, Mr Matthews records that overall the business is well controlled, however softness in sales has proven the weakness and that the forecast that National Music, Music had given NAB in February 2010 allowed for repayment of, uh, amounts of the market rate for selling, however this, is now, uh, this now cannot be achieved. The next paragraph says, as a mitigant, principal's guarantor, you and your wife, have now committed all funds received from the sale of our security, Goanna Downs, to debt reduction, albeit that some $100,000 may be retained for personal expenses. The property has been on the market since February 2010, but is a specialised broodmare farm in the Hunter Valley and is taking considerably more time than anticipated <coughs> to find a suitable buyer. And then he says, principals have provided the, report, the following report, and what follows is, in quotes, and italicised. Do you accept, Mr uh, Dillon, that what appears in italicised quotes was a report that you gave to Mr Matthews? I do. And... I don't remember the detail of writing that, but it looks... Looks like you. It does. <laughs> um, and uh, can I draw your attention in particular to the very last line of the quoted italicised passage on the second of those pages? Be assured we are keener than the NAB to see it sold and our debt levels drastically reduced. Which was true. Which was true. Uh, it was uh, an important motivating factor in putting Goanna Downs on the market in that period to reduce your back debt. The, the first time we went into SBS was a shock and that was a big motivating factor. Uh, just, just to be clear, Mr Dillon, at this time you were not in SBS and had not been categorised. So while Mr Matthews had referred you to SBS earlier that year, your file was not being managed by SBS at that stage and had never been. Do you follow? I do, because I thought you'd said we'd been in SBS earlier in the year. That's why I was careful to say Mr Matthews had referred you to SBS, but then after you implemented the, uh, the recommendations of the Johnston Rourke report, your file was not categorised, so you didn't... You didn't uh, get formally accepted into S SBS, and that will be Mr McNaughton's evidence. Do you follow? Yep. So at this stage, you, s you have not actually been um, categorised and your file brought within SBS? Yep. And so the, the proposition that I'm putting to you is that during this period in 2010 and following, it was a major motivating factor in selling Goanna Downs to drastically reduce bank debt. Yeah, I'm not sure of the relevance, but yeah, we, we said we always wanted to sell it, so. And uh, you accept that that's what you, that's what you told Mr Matthews? Well, there's a line in there I disagree with. I don't, do not recall ever having said we would contribute all the funds of the sale. Um. Mr uh, Dillon, I accept you don't recall that. Do you accept that uh, it is unlikely that Mr Matthews, the careful person that you found him to be, would have recorded that in this document if you had not told him that? It's unlikely. Not impossible, but unlikely. Um, Commissioner, I have a way 
to go. I'm happy to continue as long as... How much is a way to go? Uh, I suspect a good three quarters of an hour. Well, uh, I won't sit on for that length of time, no, Ms indeed, Harris. Can I uh, just ask you, uh, to what end are we trying to get? Uh, Commissioner... Trying to get that the bank's files say what they say? Are we getting beyond that? Uh, Commissioner, we... we we, will com we confine ourselves strictly in our cross-examination to the propositions put against NAB in Mr Dillon's evidence. I can identify those propositions if the Commission wishes, but we have been astute only to respond to things that we consider need to be responded to, well, having regard to Mr McNaughton's evidence and Mr Bassett's evidence. I'll resume at 9.45 tomorrow. Yes, Ms. Harris. Uh, Mr. Dillon, um, we might fast forward to 2015 now. Uh, in your statement, do you have that with you in the witness box? I do. In my bag. I thought it came up here, but that's all right. WIT 0001 0045 0001. In uh, paragraph eight of your statement, you identify various facilities that National Music had with the NAB. That's correct. Uh, and in, a, in addition to the ones you've listed, uh, there was also a business card facility, was there not? There was. And uh, in paragraph 10, you say that a number of the facilities uh, with the NAB were secured by Goanna Downs, as was uh, your personal home loan with the NAB, and others were secured by inventory and trade debts. And uh, you believe correctly um, that the uh, market rate facility, the trade facility, the overdraft facility, and the bank guarantee were all secured by Goanna Downs. Correct. And you understood that in 2015? Yes, I did. Uh, and uh, the, the business card facility was also secured by Goanna Downs. Yeah, I, I would take your word for that. I wouldn't. That's the way I would expect it to be. Um, Mr. Dillon, on a number of occasions yesterday, you referred to the redraw facility. Is that the market rate facility you're referring to? No, the redraw facility. Overdraft. No, the overdraft is separate to the redraw. Yeah. So, which one of these were you referring to when you were talking about the redraw? The redraw is the one that was attached to Goanna. So like the loan, the home loan and the redraw. I so your personal, your personal borrowings? Yeah. I understand. Thank you. Um, now, uh, you told Ms Diaz yesterday uh, that Mr Bassett became your relationship manager in about February 2015. Yes. And... Uh, in paragraph 18 of your statement, if you uh, still have that with you. Yes. You say that in about February of 2015, uh, you emailed Mr Bassett, as you, heard, you were aware that he had met with Ms uh, Buchanan and Mr McMahon uh, from National Mutual on the 18th of February. National Music, yeah. Uh, national, beg your pardon, National yep. Music. And uh, Ms Buchanan was uh, uh, in charge of the business and financial affairs of National Music and Mr McMahon was its managing director. Yeah, she, Lu Louisa was in charge of the finances and, and the, the business side of it. Thank you. Um, now, uh, you weren't present at the meeting, were you, because no. you were based in Brisbane. 
Um, in Scone. Uh, uh, in Scone, I beg your pardon. And uh, but you emailed Mr. Bassett after the meeting <coughs> to arrange a catch up with him. Uh, can we bring up NAB 134-006-4626? And can we have 4626 and 4627 side by side, please? And if we look on the, the bottom of the right uh, page, this is your email to Mr Bassett uh, and uh, suggesting a catch up. And you see at the end of the second paragraph, you say, obviously I can shed some light on the situation with Goanna Downs as well. Yes. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And then, um, do you mind just reading to yourself um, the, the balance of the uh, email chain? Yes. Now, um, and we'll leave that up on the screen if you don't mind. Uh, in your statement at paragraphs 21 and 22, um, you have set out your recollection of that meeting and you gave some evidence about it yesterday also. Yes. And uh, you say there that when you met Mr Bassett, he immediately wanted to discuss the possible sale of Goanna Downs. Yes. That's your recollection. It is. And you say uh, you told him that you wanted to try and sell it so that you could move to Melbourne and obtain some cash to inject into national music. That's correct. And uh, you say you told him that you wanted to retain some sale proceeds to relocate and buy a small uh, home near family in Melbourne. That's correct. And uh, you, your recollection is that he told you that NAB had no issue with the retention of most of the proceeds most of the excess funds generated by the sale. No, I don't recall. I don't recall the, the word most. Maybe. Um, uh, can I direct you I, to your statement? Yeah, I know. I'm looking at it. I can see it. Um, I suppose in reality it is most of it. So maybe I, I have said that, but the amount retained was going to vary according to the price. Of, so, the, of the replacement property? No, or, according, or to, according to the sale price of, of the farm. So if we had achieved what we were thinking we would achieve at that time, it would have been 910,000 less two or 300. So it is probably most. As it was actually sold at 2.22, the residual was about 670. If you took 300 out of that, it's just in excess of half. I understand, Mr Dillon, but your, your recollection is that uh, Mr Bassett assured you that NAB had no issue with you retaining those excess proceeds of sale? No, he never expressed any issues at all. He basically said we were, it was a good plan. I don't remember the exact words, but that was the inference. So you remember him saying that, or do you remember that he didn't object? No, I remember him commenting that it was a satisfactory or a good plan. I don't remember the wording. I see. And there was no objection to it. I see. Uh, and uh, he asked you questions about the sale price you wanted? He did. And how you were marketing the property? He did. And uh, he asked you, you said yesterday, it doesn't appear in your statement, but you said in evidence yesterday that he asked you whether you were going to reduce the price on the property, is that something He asked if that was a possibility or did we need to do that? I see. Uh, and uh, he didn't, you say he didn't discuss with you alteration of National Music's facilities once Goanna Downs was sold or whether NAB would require any further security? No. 
Um, but you did, as you, as you just told the Commission, you did understand at that time that Goanna Downs was security for your personal borrowings, the market rate facility, the trade finance facility, the overdraft facility, the bank guarantee facility and the business card facility. I did. Um, now, the only record of the meeting with Mr Bassett uh, that you've referred to in your statement is the email uh, train that we have on the screen. That's correct. And uh, you don't have any other written records of that meeting, I take it? I didn't feel it was necessary to take notes. I understand. <laughs> Uh, but you've set out your recollection as best you can, bearing in mind that it was three years ago. Now, um, in the course of preparing your statement, were you made aware that Mr Bassett had created a note of that meeting? I don't, don't believe I am aware of that, no. Um, so you don't believe you were shown any, any note that was created by Mr Bassett of the meeting? It's not in your statement. No, I've, I've, I have read copious quantities <laughs> and your submission is 60 pages long, which I still haven't finished reading. So no, I don't remember if I've read a, a note no, about that or no, not. There's no criticism, Mr Dillon. I just want to establish whether you've read it or not read it. Um, can we bring up, please, uh, NAB 005, 376-1199. Yes, it's an exhibit to Mr Nor uh, McNaughton's statement at tab 91. Sorry, Elvis. Um, so you see this is headed Close Monitoring Action Plan customer name, National Music, and you see the date there, the 19th of March 2015. I do. Um, and uh, would you mind reading, please, I know it's a bit, but would you mind reading um, the text from uh, the words comments details at about a third away down the page down to the, the end? Okay. Thank you. Um, and so you see from uh, the first paragraph, Mr Bassett has referred to his meetings with National Music, but the separate catch-up that was necessary for you because you were not based in Brisbane. That's correct. And then uh, under the heading Other Cash Flow Request, <coughs> you see uh, the client has identified a cash flow requirement for assistance to a level of $200,000 for a period of four months the request coming for 200,000 for six months, and that was what you were asking NAB for at that time? That's, I believe, what we were asking for. Louisa was managing that. Thank you. Uh, now, um, under uh, the heading additional, Mr Bassett discusses uh, mat matters pertaining to Goanna Downs. It does. And uh, his note correctly reflects, does it not, that um, when you met with him, you told him that you had recently put Goanna Downs back on the market? We had. And his note uh, correctly reflects that uh, you told Mr Bassett that you had chosen different Sydney-based agents. We had. For the purposes of marketing the property. Uh, it correctly reflects that you told Mr Bassett that you were going to employ a different marketing strategy 
than strategies you'd previously used with Goanna Downs. We were. And in particular, it correctly reflects that you told him that you were going to put the property to auction and that the Sydney agents were trying to raise interest among Sydney buyers in particular. Correct. And uh, it correctly reflects that you told Mr Bassett that you had already spent $20,000 on marketing. Correct. Uh, and it correctly reflects, does it not, that you told him that the lowest price you were willing to accept was around $2.2 million. That's correct. And indeed, that was the uh, that was the bottom of the range in which the property was being advertised at that time, wasn't it? It was being advertised in the range of 2.2 to 2.4. That is not my recollection. There was, it was going to auction, so there was no price. Okay. Can I, um, we'll come back to this document in a moment, but can I take you to uh, NAB 005 001? This is tab 144 to Mr McNaughton's statement. And can we have uh, 0001 and 0002 up, please? Uh, do you see that that is uh, uh, an article? as it were, uh, relating to the sale of your property, which quotes you as telling the author of the article some things about Goanna Downs and the proposed sale. I don't actually remember who Nick Hayden is. No, no, I, I understand that, Mr Dillon. I'm, uh, I'm really wanting to orient you in the document. And um, if, you, if you'd like to read it, you'll see that it quotes you as talking about the sale of Goanna Downs. It does. And then in the second last paragraph on page two, do you see it says it's scheduled for auction on April 23 with price expectations in the range of 2.2 to 2.4 million? It says that. And that's consistent with what Mr Bassett has recorded in his note? Well, he obviously had a copy of this. So you might have pro uh, provided him with a copy of this we, document? We provided him with all the advertising from the time he asked for it. Thank you. Um, now, uh, if we go back to Mr, uh, Mr Bassett's note, which is NAB 005-376-1199, Looking at the bottom of the page, Mr Bassett's note correctly reflects that you told him that you were currently motivated by health concerns of yourself and your wife and having new grandchildren in Melbourne, so that you wanted to move to Melbourne? Correct. And it correctly reflects, does it not, that you told Mr Bassett that you wanted to move to Melbourne and rent? No. Definitely not. So, um, Mr Bassett got everything else in this note right but that last, last question. But that just a moment. That question is, uh, I think, uh, unfair to uh, uh, seek to elicit a generalised acceptance of the whole of a note which is not of this witness's creation, Ms Harris. If you want to, if we have to go through it line by line and that is to achieve some end, we will do that but not a generalised acceptance of somebody else's note of this length and complexity. Um, Commissioner, I'll rephrase the question so that it is specific to the matters which I have put to Mr Dillon arising from the note. Mr Dillon, you have agreed with me that the note correctly reflects a number of things that you told Mr Bassett about the sale of Goanna Downs. It does. And. Uh, 
is it the case that Mr. you say Mr Bassett's note does not correctly reflect that you told him that you wanted to move to Melbourne and rent? It does not. And uh, Mr Dillon, do you recall yesterday that I showed you a document created in April 2010 by your former banker, Mr Matthews, and we can bring it up if you like mm -hmm. once I finish the question. And that, uh, that document, EBL 23, said that you plan to use part of the proceeds of Goanna Downs to buy another principal place of residence, which could then be offered as security. Correct. And so what I'm suggesting to you, Mr Dillon, is that it's possible, is it not, that you have got those two conversations confused, that you have confused what you told Mr Matthews in 2010 with what you, with what you told Mr Bassett in 2015? It's simply not possible. Now... Um, you accept that there's no reference in the document that you've read to any plan on your part to buy a property? Which document? The one in front of you that no, I asked you to read. Because he's inferring on renting, not buying. Uh, um, uh, there's no reference in it to you buying a property. No, I realise that. No. And uh, at the time you were speaking to Mr Bassett, you hadn't identified a property that you wanted to buy in Melbourne? No. And so uh, you didn't have any alternative property which you could offer as security if Goanna Downs were sold? No property, but the intent was that the money that was the residual to be used as the deposit would be put on, put on fixed deposit in the NAB and they would have a, a, a hold or a lien or whatever over that until we had purchased. Well, Mr um, Dillon, you refer to that in paragraph 23 of your witness statement. But you don't say in your statement that these are matters which you actually told to Mr Bassett. And you don't have any recollection of doing so, do you? The detail of... The facilities and ongoing security was not discussed at all at that meeting. I, I understand that. So paragraph 23 reflects your then present intention, but not something that you had expi explicitly discussed with Mr Bassett. Not at that meeting. I understand. Thank you. Um, now, uh, going back to Mr Bassett's note, just for completeness, we see in the penultimate paragraph on the page the reference to the Malulabar unit mm. and that, that at, at that stage it was going on the market in late March, early April and the plan was to sell it for 800000 to a million dollars and deposit uh, your half into a trust which would then on loan some funds to National Music and then upon selling of Goanna Downs uh, um, you would inject between two hundred and four hundred thousand into national music and pay back the corresponding amount by the trust. Do you recall uh, telling Mr. Bassett that? No. Uh, is it consistent with your plans at the time? No. It's not. All right. Thank you. Um, now the things that are recorded in Mr. Bassett's close monitoring action plan <coughs> were uh, recorded in that document on the 19th of March, two and a half weeks after he met with you. We saw that from the day. I did. And, and you've told the Commission that you kept no note, uh, understandably, of your discussion with Mr Bassett and you're relying on your memory of the I discussion. Am. And no one is criticising you, Mr Dillon, for the failings of memory, but do you accept that, generally speaking, 
it's more likely that if someone made a contemporaneous or near contemporaneous note of a meeting three years ago, that note is likely to be more accurate than the unassisted memory of a participant in the meeting now. I would accept Mr. that. Mr. Yes, Mr. Commissioner, Ms. Harris is putting forward a submission at this point about the documents and the import of documents. It's not something that Mr. Dillon should have to answer, Commissioner. Yes, Ms. Harris. Uh, uh, Commissioner, it's, it's, a, it's a fair question because Mr. Dillon's what evidence... What I do with his answer, Ms. Harris? I mean, it, it hardly comes after however many years as a judge as a surprise to have counsel say, look at the contemporaneous notes, they're more likely to be accurate than uh, memories some years after the event. Now, uh, Commissioner, what, what am I meant to do with Mr Dillon's answer? Commission, Commissioner, uh, that will be my submission and as a matter of fairness, I'm putting it to Mr Dillon. And if I'm not required to do that as a matter of fairness, then I'll move on. Well, if you think it fair to put it to him, you put I, it to I, him. I ha am I allowed to answer? <laughs> Having cut you off, Mr Dillon. No, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Having cut you off, I can now uh, uh, say yes, go ahead and answer. Well, I would accept that the hypothesis that his short-term memory is going to be better than my long-term is true. However, I know for a fact, I'm not using memory to say that I never spoke about putting money in a trust and all that sort of thing, because I never had that plan, ever. And I know that for a fact. So I know, therefore, that part of that comment is not accurate. Um, you, you did tell uh, Ms Diaz yesterday that you were uh, planning to sell the Malula Bar. We unit, were. But that it didn't sell. It didn't. So at least that part of the note you'd accept is correct. And we pulled it off the market because our advice became that to use superannuation to pay down this was crazy, even though the bank wanted that. So we pulled it off the market and it has not been back on the market since. Understand. Now, um, again, these are matters that I need to put to you as a matter of fairness, Mr Dillon, because the evidence that will be led uh, on behalf of the bank and also from Mr Bassett is different to your recollection. I'm sure it is. <laughs> you say uh, in your statement that NAB had no issue with you retaining excess funds generated by the sale of Go and the Downs? Correct. And uh, you're aware, uh, having read the statement, that there's no mention of it in this document created by Mr Bassett? Sorry, what's it? What's uh, the question? The assurance by Mr Bassett that NAB had no issue with you retaining excess funds generated by a sale of Goanna Downs. So put the question again because I'm not, I'm confused by it. Put it again. If the Commission pleases. You, you accept that there is nothing in Mr Bassett's record to the effect that he had given you an assurance that NAB had no issue with you retaining excess funds generated by a sale of Goanna Downs. I accept that. And as I know you're aware, Mr Bassett will give evidence to the Commission and has sworn a, stat a statutory declaration for that purpose. I'm aware of that. And his evidence, it will be to the effect that in accordance with his experience and usual practice, it would have been highly unlikely for him to have given you any assurance regarding the application of the sale proceeds. People often say things to achieve an outcome that they normally wouldn't. But I accept what was said. Um, so, uh, again, do you accept that uh, the absence of that important detail from Mr Bassett's near contemporaneous note may be a more reliable indicator as to whether or not that assurance was given than your unassisted recollection, Mr. No, Dillon. I don't accept that. Okay. Um, Mr. Dillon, in paragraph 23 of your witness statement,
actually, Mr Dillon, I don't think, I think we've covered the ground we need to cover there and I won't trouble you further on that. Just excuse me, please. Now, um, Mr Dillon, the property went to auction in uh, April 2015 on the 22nd of that month. Um, I think that's the date. I, I would say that's correct. You, you said very early yesterday, but then um, assisted by that email that we... Yeah, saw I saw the dates on the email where he wished us luck, so I'm assuming that's that correct. That was the date. And uh, in paragraph 25 of your witness statement, you say... We sold Goanna Downs on the 30th of April for 2.2 million to the highest bidder at the auction. The offer was below what we were hoping to receive for the property. However, we decided to accept this lower offer because I felt some pressure from the NAB to sell. Correct. That? And you repeated that yesterday uh, in your evidence. You said yesterday we accepted because we felt under pressure from NAB. Yes. Now, uh, the the two point two million dollars was within the range for which the property was advertised. That was not an ad; it was a story, and I don't remember that fellow and giving him those numbers. Uh, it was never advertised at two point two million. Uh, that article, of course, quoted you extensively, Mr. Dillon. Doesn't mean it's accurate. So are you, you just you're disputing that those were the figures that were given to the author? Well, given by whom, Ms Harris? Are you disputing that those figures were given... I certainly do not recall ever giving him a number at 2.2, ever. I see. All right. Um, now, uh, we saw yesterday the email exchange that you had with Mr Bassett on the 22nd and 23rd of April where he wished you luck and asked you how it went. Yep. And you came back and uh, and told him the story of your, your strange day. Now, um, we can bring that email uh, train back up if you like, Mr Dillon, but uh, there was nothing in that email exchange was there that you could characterise as pressure from NAB to sell the property? No, not in that exchange. I don't think so. So, Mr... Uh, and there were no communications that you recall after that exchange between you and Mr Bassett prior to you doing the deal at 2.2 million? No. Now, I want to understand then and give you an opportunity, Mr Dillon, to say why you felt pressure from NAB to accept $2.2 million when you did so on the 30th of April? We had felt pressure for some months from the very first meeting with Mr Bassett when he was quite aggressive about the, the, the whole Goanna Downs situation. We've got to get it sold. We've got to get money into the business, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that was the first time I felt really pressured I have to say, up until Mr Bassett became our business, or he was a business manager at that stage, uh, we'd never felt pressure, but just um, that they would like it sold to make things easier for us. Um, we had conversations. I cannot quote the dates, the times, because we did speak in between the two. And it was quite clear from the conversations that over that period of months that I had with Mr Bassett, that they were very keen to see the property sold. We also were keen to see the property sold. It's not like we didn't want to sell it. We were keen to move to Melbourne, my kids were coming back, all that sort of thing. But we had an expectation of a price. I had another, um, he was a client actually, a client of the farm who's a very wealthy fellow who was prepared to pay 2.5, he'd told me that, but he couldn't pay it for a year because he had to wait until he got his stallion check, he's a stallion owner. And 
we had to make a calculated decision. Do we say no and wait for Ray and see what sort of pressure comes on? Or do we just bite the bullet and accept the lower number and move on with our lives? We can go to Melbourne, buy a house and get things done. We took the latter option. And was that uh, was the 2.5 offer in 2015 or was that the one that you had reluctantly accepted in the sale that fell through in 2010? No, it was not. I see. Um, Mr Dillon, the, the property was already on the market by the time you met Mr Bassett on the 2nd of March? I would think so, yeah. The timing of all this is difficult because every year we had to take it off the market for around about five months because once we had made a commitment to our clients to fold their mares down and do all that, you can't just pull out in the middle of the season and they don't know what to do with the mares and foals and all the rest of it. So each year we had to make a decision come foaling season, which starts on the 1st of August, to pull it off if it hadn't sold and then reinstitute the process once the foaling season was over after Christmas. But at the meeting on the 2nd of March, you discussed the agents you had the property with, the marketing plans, the amounts that you'd spent on advertising. That mm. was your evidence to the Commission that, that would more than likely be correct, yes. Indeed. And uh, at uh, that meeting or thereafter, you provided Mr Bassett with advertising material. We did. Whether or not created by you that, that said, uh, the range is 2.2 to 2.4? Well, I obviously supplied him that story. It wasn't an ad because we, we managed to get a couple of stories in various papers uh, from journalists who look for interest pieces and uh, that was clearly one of them, I'd say. And uh, you've said that you had conversations with Mr Bassett <coughs> in between the 2nd of March and the 30th... Uh, and, and the uh, his email to you on the... Uh, 22nd of April, but you can't recall any of the detail? No. And you don't have any record of those? No, I don't. Thank you. Um, Mr uh, Dillon, you do recall having a conversation with Mr Bassett uh, on the 30th of April, do you, after the sale contract had been signed in which you discussed your plans for the sale proceeds? Do you remember that? Not really. Can I bring up NAB Have you seen this document before? Um, I have. When did you see that? I, I, I've seen it in the, in the preparation for this commission. I see. Whether I saw it before, I, I don't remember. Whether you saw it before you prepared your statement or not. Yeah. You meant, yes, yeah. I understand. Commissioner, sorry to interrupt. We might pull this down. It's had a reduction that hasn't been made. That needs to be made. Right. Uh, have you got that document in front of you? We'll need to give you a, no. a hard copy because I want to ask a question about it. We're finding a clean copy somewhere. So just to check, uh, Mr Dillon, have you got a, a document that bears in the top right hand corner the, uh, the notation NAB 134-007-9169? I do. And uh, you see that the bottom of that email chain is the email from your solicitor to Mr Bassett uh, attaching the front page of the contract of sale. I do. And then 
You see the top email is one from Mr Bassett to Mr Moynihan. Uh, Ms Moynihan, <laughs> beg your pardon, copied to her assistant, Ms Chang, uh, attaching the contract. And then he says, in my brief discussion with Ross, he advised the following with respect to his initial plans with the funds. And you see what's there set out, pay out 1.15 against the property, which was your personal borrowing. Yep. 200,000 international music. <coughs> yep. Pay out credit cards and invest the rest into an annuity type investment, identify bank shares and strong dividend yield to enable his drawing on national music to reduce by $50,000 per annum. Um, now, uh, you see that that email is sent to Ms Moynihan uh, not long after he has received the contract of sale. I do. Um, having read that email, do you recall the discussion with Mr Bassett shortly after the, the contract was signed? No. Um, so, you, assuming for, for present purposes that it uh, correctly records what you told Mr Bassett on that occasion, you see there is nothing in there about buying another property. No, that's correct. Um, again, I'd, I'd need to put to you, Mr Dillon, that with the passage of time, is, is it possible that you are mistaken in what you say you told Mr Bassett about needing the proceeds of sale to buy another property? No, it's simply not possible. There are other documents, which I'm sure you'll see in due course, that prove my argument. And what, what documents are you referring to, Mr I'm Dillon? I'm not able to, to show them to you because I don't have them. Perhaps uh, who, other people have them. Who has them, Mr Dillon? I couldn't tell you. I see. I don't know the answer to that. Um, now, uh, Mr... Mr... Uh, Bassett then consulted with Ms Moynihan uh, and uh, the evidence will be that she told him that all of, the, all of the proceeds would need to be remitted to NAB to pay down debt. I have read that. And uh, Mr Bassett then called you on the 1st of May and this is the conversation that you deposed to in paragraph 27 of your statement. It is. Uh, and uh, that's the one in which you say, um, what are we going, your recollection is you said, what are we going to buy a house with? Exactly. Okay. Um, but um, having seen Mr Bassett's note of the day of his discussion with you the day before, which makes no mention of buying a house, you don't accept that you're misremembering no. that that is something that you told Mr Bassett? No. Now, it was uh, your unhappy conversation with Mr Bassett on the 1st of May that led to the meeting between you Mr Bassett, Mr McMahon, Louise Buchanan uh, on the 4th of May and you gave some evidence about that yesterday, although you said you, you didn't recall much of the, the meeting. Is that right? That's correct. Now, um, it, that meeting was uh, summarised in a document to which you were taken yesterday. Can we bring it back up? NAB 134 2614. Exhibit 17 to Mr Dillon's statement, is it? Uh, it may be. It's, exhi it's exhibit to tab 110 of Mr uh, McNaughton's <coughs> statement. Yes, it's the same document, Commissioner. <coughs> now, uh, we don't need to go through the 
the whole of the email again, um, I need to ask you about your evidence about what appears under the words go under downs. And the email records an unconditional sale contract has been secured on Goanna Downs for 2.2 million, 2.22 million to, uh, to be settled mid June 2015. Ross has indicated that he is willing to provide the following to NAB from the net funds, net settlement funds of 2.12 million. And perhaps we should just bring up alongside uh, 2615 so you can see the balance of that. Now, your evidence uh, yesterday was that that was an inaccurate characterisation of what you had said at the meeting? Correct. Uh, I think yesterday you said uh, we weren't asked. Exactly. We were told it was not a, a, that I was willing to do anything. We were told what we were doing. S so, uh, just so I'm clear, Mr... Dylan, you say Ms. Ms. Moynihan told you that you had to do what appears under the words go Anna Downs, that you had to provide funds for the net settlement proceeds against the, the five facilities that are there mentioned, four facilities that are there mentioned with a total pay down of 1.958 million. I don't recall a specific mention of which funds. I just recall we were told that all the funds from the sale would be used to apply to debt. Yes. I, well, can't, so be, that... I can't be specific about the exact individual things because that took two or three weeks to settle what was coming off what. Well, so, so this is the reason for my question, Mr Dillon. Um, Later in the email, she makes clear that all of the net proceeds are to be applied, but that is in an amount greater than what appears in that summary. In that summary, the total pay down is 1.958, not the total net settlement funds of 2.12 million. Do you see? No, I don't. Where are you looking? Which page? Uh, the, do you see underneath, when we go um, further down, if you, why don't you read from uh, NAB facilities secured by going to Downs on the second page down to the bottom of the page and in particular what appears um, immediately before, under Goanna Downs at the bottom of the page. Yeah, I see that. She's talking about the sh a shortfall of 257,000. Uh, I'm, I'm referring um, not just to that, but the first sentence, the proceeds of the Goanna Down property sale are to be applied to the NAB facilities as detailed above. And I realise that it's confusing, um, but it's a different proposal to the one that appears on the preceding page where only part of the funds were to be applied. Yeah, that, that doesn't surprise me. And so in her email, she's doing two things. She's recording something she says you told her that you were willing to do. And then she's saying um, that doesn't come up to scratch and NAB's position is that you're going to have to apply all of the proceeds. Correct. And, and so... Uh, again, there's no criticism, Mr Dillon, with the passage of time and accepting that, as you said yesterday, your memory of this meeting was not clear. Um, I'm suggesting that you did in fact say to her at that meeting that you were willing to provide those funds as set out on, uh, under the first Goanna Downs heading. I would say to you that we accepted that we were told we would apply all funds. I don't even accept that I said a number because I didn't know what the, the balance would be. I also would like to say that 
I didn't understand this document, Michael McMahon didn't understand it, Louisa Buchanan didn't understand it, and our accountant couldn't make sense of it. None of it added up. Can I take you to another document? NAB 134-006-4919, which is tab 112 to Mr McNaughton's statement. Do you see uh, this is a continuation of the same email chain? See at the bottom of the page, Ms Moynihan's email to you and then your response. Can you read that to yourself, please? Uh, and uh, you apologised for seeming a little aggressive and say you were taken by surprise and that up until Friday morning, which would be the 1st of May, probably when you spoke to Mr Bassett, you'd been led to believe that all was on track and the injection of 200000 would fix any issues the bank had. So I fully accept your analysis of our situation uh, and so on. And then you say in the third paragraph, Thank you for your preparedness to disperse the sale proceeds as requested. I did try to show good faith by putting as much as possible into debt reduction. Now, Mr Dillon, does that assist you to recall? I can put some context around that. Uh, uh, might I finish the question and, and then please go ahead? Your wife. Uh, does that assist you to recall that it was in fact your request that 1.958 million of the 2.12 million sale proceeds were to be applied to NAB facilities to reduce debt? We were told they would be applied. We were now in a situation where they had taken what security we had we were extremely fearful that they would shut us down altogether once they had their money. A decision was taken that the only way forward for us, because we had no option to go to another bank because they had already sold the property, if we approached the bank to take over our finances with no Goanna Downs, um, only a business that was struggling, which was never in dispute, we would not find anybody. So we had to make a decision that whatever the bank wanted at that point in time, we would comply. I don't recall specific numbers in this thing, but all I knew was that they were taking the lot. Mr Dillon, I have to draw your attention to the language that you have used. Thank you for your preparedness to disperse the sale proceeds as requested. That I is requested write by you. a very polite letter when I can, because we were trying to get along with the bank. Um, you've said a number of times that uh, you were in shock after this meeting, and I want to understand why that was so, Mr <coughs> Dillon. You said earlier that Goanna Downs secured your personal borrowings of $1.15 million, <coughs> plus National Music's overdraft facility, trade finance facility, market rate facility, bank guarantee facility, and your business card facility. You knew that? We did. Uh, as at the 4th of May 2015, leaving aside your personal borrowings, National Music's facilities secured by Goanna Downs amount, uh, stood at almost $2 million. Do you accept that? Yes. And once the, the property, that security asset had been sold, that security for those borrowings would disappear, would it not? It would but there are two additional points to that. 
A, our facilities at no stage in the entire history of national music have ever been anywhere near maxed out. They usually operated between 60 and 70% of capacity, even though the bank treats it as 100%. And the second point's gone. I get too angry. <laughs> Um, at the time that this security asset was sold, you had nothing to replace it to secure those facilities? Well, no, because the intent, strangely enough, was to use the house we bought in Melbourne as additional security. But Mr Dillon, there is not a word about that in any of the documents that I have shown you. None in the ones you've shown me, I'm sure. No, and, and I'm sure, Mr Dillon, if I was aware of such a document, I would be required as a matter of fairness to show it to you. I could not put these questions if I was aware of such a document. I want you to understand that and no doubt council assisting would have put such a document to you. The only document of which I am aware in which you made such a statement was the one back in 2010. Yeah. Now, um, Mr Dillon, you said on a number of occasions that Ms Moynihan told you during this meeting and the exchanges that you had at this time, that her problem was the lack of security. You said that yesterday you in your evidence. You knew that was her problem. And, and you've also said, both in your statement and in your oral evidence, that if NAB didn't continue to support you, no other bank would lend to you because of the lack of that security. Don't you think if we knew the bank was going to do what it did, that I wouldn't have gone to my brother and got the half a million dollars he later put in to stop losing our home. We had an expectation that we would have a home in Melbourne. Kevin Matthews, our first banker knew it. Michael Swindell, our second banker knew it. Sean Bassett knew it. Doesn't seem to matter. Um, Mr. Dylan, let's move on to reduction in facility limits. Um, you've said in your statement and then again in your evidence that NAB insisted that the limit of the trade finance facility must be drastically <coughs> reduced and in fact reduced it by more than half. You've said that in paragraph 34 of your statement. Correct. And uh, you say uh, in paragraph 36 that Ms Buchanan, who managed the finances of the business, calculated that you would need a minimum trade facility level of at least 50% more than NAB was willing to provide. Correct. And uh, you said yesterday to the Commissioner at transcript 2836, we were going to lose the home but it was made clear at the 4 May meeting that they were going to also reduce our facilities not only to the level of the payout would allow but even lower and that was just disastrous. Do you recall that? I do. And you say in your statement at paragraph 37 that there were other facilities which NAB could have reduced which were not as vital to your business being the asset finance facility and the debt or finance facility. Do you see that in paragraph facility, 37? Which is the asset facility. Um, oh, that's the, the car leases. Okay. Indeed. Um, and what was the second one? The, the asset finance facility uh, and the debt or facility. The asset finance facility, um, do you have your statement there, the exhibits to your statement there? No. Um, we can... Uh, Can Mr Dillon be provided with a copy of his... We can just bring it up on the screen, actually. NAB 
feel like I've slowed the system down again, Mr. <coughs> Dylan. I'm sorry. We have a clean copy. It's a, it's a little one. Are you able to read That's that, fine. Mr Dillon? All right, let's do that. It'll speed things up a little bit. As to which, Ms Harris, how much longer do you expect to require? Uh, no more than 10 minutes. <coughs> so what, what am I looking for in this? Uh, uh, tab five. Tab five. Yep. That's what you've identified in your statement as the asset finance facility. Yep. And that's the, the as you say, was the facility uh, that you used to acquire cars and so on. And that was an arrangement whereby, in effect, NAB acquired the car and then leased it back to you or loaned you the money to do it on security of the cars. Yep. And then the preceding tab uh, is the debtor finance facility and that was an arrangement under which you sold your trade debts to NAB at a discount to their face value. Well, they pay 80% up front and then when the debt is paid, they pay the balance. And, and so uh, that was the thing that allowed you to offer credit terms to your customers, is that yep. right? Yep. Um, and neither of those facilities was secured by Goanna Downs. That's what no, you said. No, I think they're secured by mortgage over stock and, in, and debtors. Indeed. And, uh, and in paragraph 37 of your statement, you say that NAB could instead, uh, instead of reducing the balance on the, the, sorry, the limits on the trade finance facility, it could have reduced the limits on those facilities. Do you see that? I do. And you say and that wouldn't have, dam that wouldn't have done as much damage to the business? Correct. Um, now, and you say uh, at paragraph 37 that NAB didn't understand the importance of the trade finance facility and that the reduction in the limits caused you to suffer those losses that you refer to in paragraph 38. They certainly did. Now, um, I need, again, as a matter of fairness, Mr Dillon, I need to point out to you that the contemporaneous documents indicate that National Music decided how the limits in its facilities were to be reduced. I am aware of, of the fact that Louisa and Nigel did the negotiating with Margaret. I'm also aware that the quantum of, of the amount that they were taking off the facilities, there was really no option but to, to take it off trade because those facilities were not secured by Goanna Downs. So when you look at the range of facilities and the amount that had to come off, most of it had to come off trade. There was no option to, to you might have fiddled 50,000 here or there, but that's basically was my understanding that because there was such a large amount coming off, the biggest figure in there is trade. That's where it had to come from. So let's These were not included. So let's pick that apart for a minute. You, you said um, that these two facilities, the asset, uh, the asset finance facility and the debtor finance facility, were not secured by Goanna Downs. So do you accept that reducing the limits of those facilities didn't solve the security problem that Ms Moynihan had raised with you? Oh, I do. How could it solve this, that security problem? Well, if they hadn't reduced everything as much as they had, they would have had a house to use as alternative security plus the mortgage on stock and debtors. They always try and get double the cover they need. That's just the bank's process. Um, but we were more than covered. Um, and again, but you, again, you accept that you hadn't profited another property as secure, substitute security? Well, I didn't have another property. Indeed. Because we were trying to buy one and they'd made it clear that we couldn't. Therefore, we couldn't offer it. Uh, Mr 
Dylan, can I take you to uh, oh, yeah, stuff. <coughs> a number of emails which follow the discussion that you had on the 4th of May. The first one is uh, tab 114 of McNaughton and it's NAB 134006-4829. This is an email from Ms Moynihan to you on the 5th of May and uh, where she makes clear that the proceeds <coughs> of Goanna Downs are to be applied to the NAB facilities. And then uh, towards the, the bottom of that second paragraph, she says there'll be a shortfall, this will need to be rolled into the new facilities. The discretionary part of the settlement will be how the remaining facilities are structured. And this will be something that you will discuss with Sean. So you were given a discretion around the structure of the facilities. Do you see that? Yeah, yes. And then on, uh, the tw uh, on the 6th of May, the next day, Mr Bassett wrote to you it's at NAB 134 tab 120. I'm sorry, 134-006-4834. Mr Bassett writes to you on the 6th of May, application of funds portfolio <coughs> facility to be paid out, balance of proceeds to be applied to a combination of the following facilities, which were all the ones that were secured by Goanna Downs, with facility limits, his emphasis, to be reduced by 970,000, respective mix of limit reductions to be guided by national music. See that? I do. And then uh, you met uh, you've given evidence that uh, you and Ms. McMahon, uh, Ms. Buchanan and Mr. McMahon met with Mr. Bassett and Ms. Moynihan on the 11th of May, and then on the 12th, she followed up with another email asking you how you wanted those limits to be structured. Can I show you that uh, that email? It's NAB 134. 0092649, tab 122 of McNaughton. Uh, 
She says she's collated the account information in an Excel spreadsheet, and we'll come to that in a moment. The remaining facility limit to allocate between the various national music accounts will be close to 1.9 million. And then she says, if Louisa could please have a look at the remaining facilities and the accounts they are required to service and complete column D in the spreadsheet. This will enable us to get documentation and arrangements underway prior to settlement. The spreadsheet is see in column D the one that Louisa has been asked to complete. She's been asked to complete the column relating to the limits. That is to suggest what the new limits should look like for those facilities. Do you accept that? Yes. And now I can, perhaps I can skip to document 134 0064835. This is tab 127 to McNaughton. You see that's an email from uh, Mr. Fisher, perhaps we can bring up the second page of that 4836 as well, while we're looking at it. And he says, on behalf of Ross Dillon and National Music, the following facility reduction proposal is now provided. And he says of the broadly agreed 970,000 available funds from the sale of Goanna Downs, 20,000 be made available to Ross Dillon to reimburse for advertising costs. You see that? Yes, I do. And uh, after reduction of the $20,000 advertising costs, 950 would be available for reduction in the National Music Facilities. And then he sets out National Music's proposal for how that is to occur. Trade finance facility limit of 650,000 reduction and a reduction in the overdraft of 200,000. <coughs> no reduction in any of the other facilities in column D of the spreadsheet. Where's column D? Oh, I beg your pardon, the, the one that we just saw. I can, I can read them to you. The market rate facility, the business card facility, and the bank guarantee facility. Okay. The market rate facility, they had requested monthly payments, so that was ignored. But, but Mr Dillon, that was ignored because you chose to ignore it. NAB left it to your discretion as to how to change the limits. I would point out, you treat this like I was sitting in my office at National Music going over all this. I was filing down files at four o'clock in the morning and other people were handling this, not me. However, However, having said that, if you do the maths, you're trying to apply $950,000 to a limited range of the facilities. Can we go back to the previous document with the numbers on it? Spreadsheet. Yep. That is uh, NAB 134-009-2650. And I think it needs to be displayed uh, landscape rather than portrait because there's a further column. Yes, that's, that's correct, Commissioner. Mr Dillon, you wanted to make a point about this okay. document? 
If you look at the ones in brown in the middle, 5 to 11, the portfolio facility was eliminated. It was eliminated. Indeed. The business card facility, which is what our reps operate on when they travel around Australia, so you need something. It was cut in half. We took that down to 20,000. The overdraft facility, if you recall, we had just applied for a $100,000 increase because we were fully aware that there was a bump in the road coming with the Allens Billy Hydes thing until the September. So we could hardly reduce that from 260 when we're in the middle of applying for an extra $100,000 because that was our cash flow. But that you would did make... do it. Sorry? You did do that, Mr Dillon. You did. In yes. The, the proposal I just showed you, you did do that. But it went back up again. Indeed. Indeed. Um, that by a hundred thousand. By a hundred thousand dollars. Until the until the thirtieth of September. The bank guarantee facility cannot be altered, because it's a guarantee to the to the landlord of the, the premises that we were in. So even if you reduce the market rate facility, you still have to take off uh, nine fifty six, probably six hundred and fifty thousand off it. Uh, well, no, the, the trade finance facility was reduced by 650000 So if you had instead deployed some of that reduction against the market rate facility, you wouldn't have had to reduce the trade finance facility by that much. Do you accept that? Well, I, I would accept that we didn't do it. I, I'd have to ask Louisa Indeed. the rationale behind it. But my understanding, it was not touched because there was an arrangement to pay it on a monthly basis, and that was much simpler. Um, Mr Dillon, just g going back, this is the final document I need to take you to, I think, is the, the one that we just had up, NAB 134-006-4835. Um, and you see that uh, in numbered paragraph two, Mr Fisher proposes those reductions which amount to 950,000. And then in paragraph three, he volunteers further non-cash reductions to national music facilities, including the reduction of the business card facility. He was requested that. That was not volunteered. They wanted further reductions. Uh, Mr Dillon, th those numbers were not dictated by NAB, were they? The, the, non, the reduction of, the, um, of those bottom figures? Yes. Well, they weren't dictated by NAB, but we were told we, want, we had to find another $300,000 in those facilities secured by the business. And, and uh, when were you told that? Oh, God, I have no idea. No. Um, Mr Dillon, uh, <coughs> the, the proposal that's set out in this letter was accepted by NAB, was it not? It looks accurate to me. Um, I can show you tab uh, 131 of McNaughton, NAB 134-006-4845. the bottom e email from Ms Moynihan to Mr Fisher, a copy to Ms Chang. Hi Nigel, I refer to your proposal below and advise that it's been approved, etc. Yep. And then you see Mr Fisher's response. Thank you for this email <coughs> and the good news within it. I didn't that? write it. <laughs> no, I know, but it was good news, wasn't it? Well, it was good news they weren't going to shut us down. Because up until that point, we thought they might pull the pin and just say goodbye. Um, Mr Dillon, there, there isn't a word in any of the documents to which I have taken you to that effect. I'm going and to I would imagine there never will be. I'm going to put to you, Mr Dillon, that in fact NAB has supported national music through some pretty difficult times, including these ones, and continues to do so. I would agree NAB has been amazing before and after the arrival of Sean Bassett and Margaret Moynihan. 
I have no further questions, Commissioner. Thank you. Mr. Tian, have you anything? No. No. Ms. Diaz? No, Commissioner. Yes, thank you very much. Mr. Dillon, you may step down. You're excused.